go. Hello for another Cafe Rollist. Uh, again, Twitter. I see the opportunities to, to interact with strangers. Uh, welcome on Cafe Rollist, uh, Draconic. Should I call you Draconic, Drac? Or do you have an, another name like me, Calum, with my um, show? Just Drac. Drac is fine. Drac. That sounds cool. Yeah. There's, there's another Draconic in my contacts on Twitter, so it's it's confusing. Really? Not... <laughs> yeah, Draconic oh, no, with actually, a I think C. I've seen them... Yeah, I think I've seen them around, actually, yeah. Also, it's draconic plural with an S, I noticed. Yeah, because um, originally I wanted to be go, go by Draconics, but it was taken. <laughs> the handle was taken, so I kind of just went with this spelling instead and went with plurals. Well, could you introduce yourself briefly to uh, yes. our viewers? So, hi, I'm Drac or Draconics. Um, I am a TTRPG streamer. I'm all over the place on Twitch, playing in any any game I physically can. Um, I'm also the co-founder and the event organizer of Friends Who Roll Dice, um, one of the co-founders anyway, and uh, which is also a TTRPG channel that where we just play a bunch of TTRPGs. Um, right now, we're doing a month-long event in October to raise money for charity. Where we're playing a bunch of one-shots, indie games, and stuff like that. And I I help organize that, so that's kind of my role. That's amazing. Um, yeah. the, I, I was just recommending recently uh, something we pre-recorded. We're going to release a, an interview with the Roleplay Heaven because it, there's a, a bit of, of fundraiser approaching with them as well. Uh, not spoiling anything. But I was telling them how much uh, there's a lot of fundraising going on on stream in the TTRPG community. And it's it's really amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really nice being able to, especially now with lockdown, it's... There's not much you can do to raise money. You can't like go out to do like big events or anything like that. So being having all the this free time all of a sudden, you might as well use it to do some good while also having fun. Yeah, my wife is part of the the Women Institute. So normally they raise funds by baking cakes and selling them. Yeah, exactly. It's not really happening at the moment, and uh, they they're not really the streaming crowd. So they they need to reinvent themselves. <laughs> yeah. So we got two ice-breaking questions on Café Rollis. Okay. The first one, they, they thought Café Rollis is a spin-off to my main show, The Rollis Podcast, and so it's it's due, it's due happening because of COVID in large part and me being unemployed uh, since January. But uh, the, so our ice-breaking questions are, what is your routine like at the moment with, with COVID uh, going on and, and so on? Um, so I'm an undergrad student. I'm a computer science undergrad. So... Um, most oh, of the time, you're cyber I'm, then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on my computer a lot. Um, I'm studying. So I'm, every morning I try to wake up on time. Sometimes I don't, but um, I usually wake up uh, more or less. I usually get onto my computer to jump into a Zoom lesson or um, just study a bit. Uh, so what I really need to do, all I need to do really is like, practice different um, programming languages, um, do you just like read up on some like legislation and stuff like that, that we're learning about. It's not, it's never really anything too major. So it doesn't take too much time. It usually takes like maybe three or four hours. And then after that, I usually just lay right back in bed <laughs> and kind of just lay there, um, watch TTRPG channels, um, watch Netflix, stuff like that. Talk to some friends, um, nap, because Studying is very mentally taxing. No, oh, it is, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I need to re yeah, so sometimes I need to recharge with a nap. And then um especially now, most of my days have to do with teach RPGs. So I usually nap until maybe around so I'm in the UK if you couldn't tell. They usually nap until around like ten PM and then I'm usually up, be active on Twitter, and then around two AM most of the games I'm in happen. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm a bit of a, a night owl, I guess, because of that. So I'm um, around 2 a.m., sometimes a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. I jump back onto my computer and role play, I guess, and depending on whatever channel I'm on. Um, yeah, or... it's, uh, I, knew, I know a few streamers and it's quite fascinating. Some of them were really uh, dedicated to their craft. So they, they would literally live in the British countryside, but with the hours of the eastern time zone in the u.s so they they would uh yeah, yeah they would stream at night and uh, and sleep at day. Uh, that was quite uh, intense uh. that was actually me so um 
I during the COVID has been going on throughout the summer. So before when end of summer when there was no like I didn't have an, the commitment of university, I was very I was able to do that. So I legitimately like when my family was awake, I was completely dead asleep. And when they went to sleep, I was just waking up to start my day. <laughs> so I definitely I was if I have the if I had the opportunity, if I didn't have this um commitment of studying in university, I probably would be one of those people as well, like sleeping at like the Pacific or Eastern Standard Time while living in the UK. <laughs> it's kind of a sinful circle though, because because things are happening at that time, if you are in the audience here in the UK, you don't have as many streams to watch during the, the UK time. Yeah. And because there's not much to see, the audience is not there, so you don't have streamers and so on. I wonder if yeah. we will ever break out of, of, of that thing at some point. I've actually never thought about that. That's actually a good point. Because um, I think it's, the reason is because there's just a huge audience in America. Yeah, and yeah. And it's a lot easier to cater to them. Yeah. I, I might... That is a good point. Like, we're not, we won't be able to cater to the UK um, audience. Because yeah. so I haven't always streamed TTRPGs. I, I've, I've been a TTRPG fan for a while, like watching streams, but I haven't played it for very long. But as, a, as someone in the UK, a lot of my favorite streams happened at 2 a.m. in the morning back when I couldn't stay up at 2 a.m. in the morning. So I guess, yeah, that's a very good point. I guess... I guess we Brits need to focus on our <laughs> audience. Then. Yeah, I don't know when it falls for for the massively uh, English speaking nations like Australia and so on in terms of, of time zones. But yeah, I, I'm I'm actually preparing a, a panel for Metatopia, and the, the topic is about the, that online sphere that we share, which is English speaking, especially from the point of view of people like me, uh, who English is not. The first language but it's it's the vehicular language so if we interact between yeah. myself portuguese japanese uh anywhere anyone in the world we'll use english and we go online but when we go online it's overly dominated just because of numbers by the u.s demographics so it's difficult yeah. to to find each other's in that crowd of u.s users say hey wait a minute well what are you like, doing yeah, in wait, spain yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah that's a very good point because like even i've like now that I'm so into the social media, like the whole community or teach RPGs, I've noticed that a lot of my, I think I tweeted about it recently, actually, that I noticed I, I took out a lot of my very British tendencies in my tweets because Americans don't understand it. Oh. So like I'd have like, there's a lot of like British slang, for example, that I, I would like instinctively type out and then realize that a lot of my audience is American. They won't understand what this means. So that's like delete and reword it. And because of how big of a demographic the American like base is, um, I don't remember his name, but there's a a, a cool TikToker. Uh, I always forget people's name because on TikTok I, I just swipe. I don't even see the the people's <laughs> name. I just see I know them. I know their face. And he's a yeah. he's a he's a black immigrant in the U.S. from the U.K. So his TikToks are very often about uh, a number of confusions or. I don't know how yeah. much, you know, comedians and made up things and so on. So uh, a number of confusions which arise when he was asking for, for stuff in the US and uh, his, uh, other and, yeah. and Americans would not understand what, what he meant when he was saying that he was coming there on holiday instead of vacation or a yeah, whole exactly, bunch of yeah. things. <laughs> or like pants, like for us, pants are like boxes and like underwear. Oh like yeah, American pants are just like trousers. So it's very weird transitioning from that. No, yeah, there's a lot of really funny like miscommunications that can happen between Americans and like just anywhere really, not just the UK. But yeah, and I've, I've noticed that I've I've been taking out a lot of my British isms, I guess I call them, um, from my tweets. I think I want to stop doing that because I realize it makes it very hard for other Brit British people to find out that there are also other British people. In the community but well, you should lean in into it you know yeah. make it uh so i guess i guess the u.s audience they could uh if you lean in into it a lot maybe uh they maybe they will come to appreciate it like it's uh yeah. i know it's ex exotic like me with my somewhat <laughs> french accent oh yeah i yeah i definitely think people would react to it as thinking it's exotic that's just such a weird thing to me for me to think about though british being exotic like 
I don't know. Personally, I don't think British is very exotic at all. <laughs> I don't know if you ever seen, but a couple of years ago in the underground, so that's the subway for our American yeah. listeners. Uh, the, there was advertisement for to go to Las Vegas, and the the pitch was go to Las Vegas where your accent is, is exotic. Like, <laughs> they were sort of selling the idea that if you were a um, British male going to Las Vegas, you would seduce oh, women God. with your accent. It yeah. was it was kind of gross, and I, I really don't. Very, yeah. I don't think it would work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think it would work either. Especially, I think this, um, the thing is a lot. Of, the thing is, people do react like that, especially to like British accents, and it's weird because, as someone who lives in Britain, you can tell the difference between different accents, and you can tell that some accents are not posh, like at all but to americans they're like wow that is, you must you must live right next to the queen right like you're that kind of posh right like i'm from i'm from essex which is not posh in the slightest it's the exact opposite of the spectrum of posh and but all the americans that talk to me are like wow your brit your your accent's so posh you sound like <laughs> you sound like the queen i'm like no i don't i really don't well i guess it's fair if you find this sound like a cowboy or a gi in world war ii movie so <laughs> yeah that's a good point actually yeah yeah in comparison i guess i do sound posh <laughs> accent are uh, funny things because so i was born in belgium and you got this thing among french speakers the it's pretty the, the french like i guess the english are sort of obnoxious towards other speakers of uh quotation mark their language uh so so first the french they got this idea of what is a belgian accent which is a made-up accent which doesn't exist really no one <laughs> used that in belgium then in belgium you got different accents and uh, and then you uh, when i went to study there were a lot of french and i sort of lost my accent i uh, kind of come to this non-accent thing which is an accent yeah. on its own because at the end of the day everybody's got an accent and they, they are different there might be a dominating one but you, you have french running into you and sort of making fun of you like oh do you speak like that and they got the weirdest french regional accent themselves and they're like oh your accent is so <laughs> yeah. funny you're like oh, have, you, have you heard yourself you don't need a yeah, song like <laughs> <laughs> yeah no yeah I, I get that a lot so for example like like I mentioned, I'm a, I'm in predominantly American streams. So whenever people like play with me for the first time, they're like, oh my God, your accent's so, so interesting, so weird. I'm like, is it, have you heard your accent though? Your accent that you sound like a, a surfer dude. How, what do you mean? You sound <laughs> like a, very a nice either girl. of you uh, to say. <laughs> <laughs> do you, in stream, have you ever tried the, uh, because I, I tend to do that. Uh, it's kind of, I, I guess, again, leaning in stuff. I tend to to force my French accent and play different characters of different background, but with a French accent. Like, oh, I'm yeah. a, I'm a, I'm a dark elf, and for me, dark elves got a French accent for for reason. Or I'm a, I'm this guy. Or like last time I played with the Gauntlet, we were playing a Fast of Furious thing, so I played a a French. Uh, I played the French, but kind of more popular accent. So I'm always doing the, the French something when I'm playing. Could be a French resistant or, or whatever. Have you played a lot of British characters and maybe going a foray into the Scots or other accents Absolutely. like that? Yeah. Some Yorkshire Mainly character. I can't do accents. I'm not good at other accents. It's tough. Huh? I'm just good at mine. <laughs> so whenever I play a character, I just say, oh, they're just inexplicably British. I'm sorry. They're, they have my accent. I can't do anything about it. Um, every so often, my accent like gets really strong out of nowhere. <laughs> it just happens sometimes. I just say something very British, and I don't even realize it myself. And um, Why, but yeah, mate? I usually lean into it. <laughs> yeah, like hey fam or something like just something like oh mate, and it just comes out just naturally. I'm like oh whoa, I didn't. That just came out, I guess. Um, <laughs> so like, recently, I played in a um, Tosmo Loop like mini series. It was just, like a four shot, and my character was based in America. But because I can't do accents, I was like, my character's British. They moved from Britain to the US. That's my explanation. Sorry, I'm not going to try to do an American accent because I, I can't. I cannot do American accents. I can do like the, the real exaggerated kind, but not like a convincing um, legitimate 
accent. You know, at the same time, there's so many examples. I'm finishing, I'm one episode away from finishing Bly Manor. And it's it's notoriously bad for accents. But the, the whole <laughs> cast is American and doing accents. Uh, it's very common to have uh, English, uh, British actors play American characters over there. And they always complain yeah. about Ewan McGregor doing a, an accent and so on. <laughs> and you got stuff even like Dragon Prince had a Scottish friend who was complaining about the the dark elves in there they, they got kind of a scottishy accent so oh, yeah. you know, in the end yeah. it's like if if the professionals are so bad why why do we <laughs> do that's it point, actually, yeah yeah that's a good way to think about it i'm gonna try yeah no that's a good point i'm gonna try i'm gonna try an accent i guess it will Next come with play. practice also so yeah. but tell me tell me more about uh friends world dice where, where is it when did it start and ah, what's so... happening soon uh, about this fundraiser so um it started i think in april um i think so yeah so um we most of us were part of a different channel um featherfall and then just just decided you know why don't we make our own channel <laughs> one that we can like fully run because we were just players on that channel we weren't like we weren't like co-founders we didn't we didn't have much like leeway i guess we could mm. pitch stuff but that's about it um so we thought you know why not just make our own channel so we we did. We just decided. We just up and made our own channel, Friends Roll Dice. Um, brought over one of the shows that we were all part of over onto um, Friends Roll Dice, and just started role playing. It was a ton of fun. Um, we wanted it to be a like as you can tell from the name. We wanted it to be a place where you can just relax, have meet great people, and have and just roll dice with friends. And um, we figured that one of the good ways to really get a message out was to make a whole thing about we want to do charity streams. We want to be a, a channel that that you're almost guaranteed to see doing a charity stream at some point. Um, so I think the first one we did that month, I think it was actually no, I think it was the month after, so April, around May. Around May we did a, a our first charity event um, where we raised money for Black Lives Matter and the Cheva project. And it was in it was incredible. <laughs> we we had only been around for like a month or two at that point, and we thought that we could only we were only going to raise about four hundred dollars. I think we ended up raising about two thousand by the wow. end of it. Wow, that's yeah. amazing! So it was incredible. It was like it was very, it was very encouraging. It let us know like we actually could do this because um, definitely at first it felt like this is a project that this is the thing we're going to do for fun. It's, it might not go anywhere. If it doesn't go anywhere, oh well. But after that, we were like, this could actually go someplace. Like, so um, we just kept that it. We kept, we added another show to the channel, which is called The Mind and the Martyr, which is still going now. Um, and every every opportunity we can, especially when there's like big global like events happening, like like um, the Lebanon crisis with the explosion happening in Lebanon, it would, we just very quickly scrambled together to do a quick charity event for that because it was in a cause that really needed attention. Um, like I didn't even hear about it until I looked on Twitter. It wasn't on the news. It wasn't, no one was talking about it amongst my friends. I only saw it on Twitter. And when I realized that no one was talking about it, I figured we should put more eyes on it by doing a charity event. Um, obviously we're a small channel, so it's not like we're getting millions of eyes back onto the onto the issue, but every little helps. So we thought we might as well do that. Um, but yeah, for this month, of October we've been doing I think this is the biggest event we've kind of done because we've we kind of got a fit in now it's been like seven or eight months since we started so we kind of know what to do we kind of got the gist of it and we're raising money for the rain network which is just a um a charity event a charity organization that uh that helps people who have who are being or going through things like um like abuse have gone through rape like incest any kind of that kind of like sexual or physical abuse they help um help them cope, go through therapy, pay for, um, I think also pay, like pay for any lawsuits and like suing stuff like that, court stuff that might need to go down as well. And also the Earth Day Network, which we kind of like shoehorned in, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, we just figured like, hey, we might have to do two events and with everything that was going on at the time, which I think was the, the wildfires, there was a lot of wildfires happening at the time. So we thought, and everyone's attention was on global warming finally about time, but because of those wildfires, people think about global warming so we thought might as well raise money for um initiatives that are trying to combat global warming and earth, the earth network was one of those things 
So we just combined those two and for the month of October and the first of November as well, we're raising money for um, those two organizations. I find it interesting you said that uh, now you, you know a bit more of things are, are running. What what did you learn? What did you find out about learning a, a channel like that and organizing uh, online events uh, like this? Um, I learned that two weeks is not enough to uh, <laughs> plan an event. <laughs> I learned that it, two weeks to plan an event will make you grow gray hairs. <laughs> um, we, in fact, I don't think, I think the first event was in one week. I think we planned it within one week because we very much underestimated how much work it took. Um, Because it wasn't, because we were such a small channel, we didn't have many shows to like, for people to come into and um, like donate to, to raise money. So we had to reach out to different people around on Twitter, like, hey, do you want to play in our game? Do you want to play in our game? And when you're reaching out to like 10, 20 people, they don't all reply to you at the same time. No. <laughs> they all, yeah. And then when you get like staggered replies, it's hard to, get those staggered replies into a group that will definitely play together, that will have a session zero together, which for us is very important, session zeros. For people that don't know, I mean, TTRPG session zeros are when the group that are going to play together, get together to talk about um, things like character creation, if they want to do that together, um, any just questions in general for the GM, but most importantly, lines and veils, which are um, things that they do or do not want to happen in the, event, in the campaign at all. It could be like linked to trauma or like phobias, things that they just do not want to be involved in the campaign. But that's what we talk about. And um, trying to organize like three or four of those with a bunch of people who are applying days or sometimes weeks late, it's very hard. <laughs> so after that, we, we managed to get it together for that first stream. But after that, we're like, next time we're waiting, we're having a whole month to prepare because <laughs> that was too stressful. <laughs> So yeah, so now with the October stream, we started planning this in like September, like even slightly before September, we started planning it so that we can have everything down. And even now we still haven't got everything down. <laughs> there are still people who haven't, haven't replied to us yet or haven't like told us when they're free for session zero. But, um, but it's, it's going a lot better than we than last time for sure, a lot less stressful. And it's a lot bigger. We've got been able to get bigger names involved as well, which I'm very excited about. So can you um, tell us a, a few of the names or any school? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the biggest one right now <laughs> is Strawberry, um, Strawberry 17. Um, they're, uh, they're mainly a game, video gaming um, streamer, but they also like occasionally role play. They uh, recently role played in a Hyper RPGs, um, RPG, Hyper RPGs on other Twitch channel. And they're pretty big. They're pretty big. They have like, I think they have like 100 something K followers on Twitter. Wow. Um, but yeah, it's wild. Um, another one we have is Abria, Abria Iyengar, which is, she's pretty big, especially now on the TTRP, in the TTRPG community. She's honestly, one, first of all, an inspiration. Like she, she kind of inspired me to get into TTRPGs in the first place. It's kind of, it's kind of like personally great to know that um, I can just like give her a poke and be like, hey, do you want to play in our game with us? <laughs> And she'd be like, yeah, sure. So um, that's one other name. Right now, I'm hoping to get Gabe James Games involved. Um, I messaged him in recent replies. So I want to see if I can squeeze him, in, him into a game. But yeah, um, nothing critical role level. Um, but maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day we'll get Matt Mercer on the, ch on the channel or something. <laughs> well, let's hope or... Some uh, AOC, uh, she seems uh, very popular as soon as <laughs> yeah. she shows up on the Twitch. Actually, that'd be pretty fun, actually. Yeah, I'll be down for that. That'd it's be funny. It's very nice when you have... Uh, I just released an episode uh, of one of my shows, Film Studies. And uh, I mean, f celebrity is a, is a weird thing. So I don't really think in terms of celebrity, but I was just very happy to have a, a podcaster I listen a lot to and I don't yeah. know in any way to be able to reach that person and say, hey, would you mind coming over to record something together? And suddenly, you know, 
I'm sort of an extrovert, so right now with COVID, it's very difficult. I miss like that's why I'm yeah. recording today. That's why I'm talking to you. I need those <laughs> conversations. Uh, otherwise, I feel very, very, very sad and bad. Uh, but yeah, you know, li you listen to podcasts. It's sort of intimate. You listen to two hosts talking to one another, and you would like to be in the room with them. So when you have an opportunity to to have them in, to be in a chat with you or to play with them, that's uh, that's a, yeah. this is a bit of magic there. It's really nice. Yeah. It was honestly very so I think the first time I found out I would Bria isn't watching this could this be very embarrassing. But <laughs> the first time I played with a Bria, I was so nervous because it was so like I think it was like a month or two in when I like I've only been streaming for like a month or two, like streaming TTRPG. So I wasn't like a big name, like I I wasn't experienced. I'd probably only Unlike like now. Three or four. Well, now you are really, <laughs> really big. Yeah. I, I don't think I don't consider myself big. Um, I'm bigger than I expected I would be for sure, but I I I'm still much I'm still very much a noob. I'm still very much a baby in this community. <laughs> um, but back then I was like a baby baby, and when I heard that I was gonna play with Bria, I absolutely had like a fanboy moment, like just a mini fanboy moment, <laughs> just freaking out because like she inspired me. She seeing her play in a game. Like especially so, especially now we're talking. It's a big thing now, representation of people of color in TTRPGs and just in general. Um, I'd been a fan of TTRPGs for years, but I just didn't. I thought I just didn't want to play. And then when I saw Abria playing, Abria was one of the first like people of color, the first black person like I saw in a stream that was like that I really enjoyed. And I realized like watching her, I realized like maybe TTRPGs is for me. Like there's someone that looks like me, someone of color, someone black playing. Maybe I can play as well. And Abria was that person for me. So being able to being able to be a noob that's only been playing for like a couple of months and then get told that, hey, you're playing with Abria Iyengar. I freaked out. <laughs> it was it was wild. It was wild to me. And then now I can just like fairly casually message her saying, hey, do you want to play in the one shot? And she'll She's very busy now. She, she's everywhere now. <laughs> but like whenever if she has a free time, she usually says, yeah, sure, why not? And she's even she even messages me sometimes saying, hey, do you want to play? It? Are you down to play in a one shot sometime? And I can say yes to Abria Iyengar, <laughs> the person that I re previously had only like watched on screen. Now I can actually just chat with pretty casually on Twitter. Have you seen a, a lot of people, a, a lot of black uh, individuals like you? Who, uh, because... Uh, Having more representation, I mean, I, I'm a white dude, uh, I run some shows, uh, I try to do better, but at the same time, it's a bit of a challenge because you got this sinful circle of there's not a lot of black people being represented, yeah. then you don't have a lot of black people who join the hobby, and, yeah, exactly, and then when yeah. you look for guests, you're, you're struggling when you're looking for, for a specific topic. So it, first of all, it's awesome that you... You you went up there and now you're you're streaming as, as, as yourself as well. Have you seen a, a lot of people who emulated you or emulated Bria and and now are streaming as well? It, it did it get a, a tiny bit better. Um, so I definitely started seeing more black people. I don't think it's thanks to me. I definitely don't have that power of like commute. I don't have that. Kind of but program. you'd be surprised, but... you know. You you you're there. Someone sees you play and that person just like you did think, hey. Maybe that thing I'm welcome in there because uh, I see people who who look and behave like me. So you, you shouldn't be modest about that. You, you... I mean, I hope I, I hope so. I really hope that I have been that person for someone. Um, at the very least, no one's told me that I have. So I don't know. But um, now that I'm in the community, but did you tell Bria? I've... Nobody told you, but Not did you tell Bria? You see, you see, you. I have, you don't I have know. at some point I did eventually actually I did tweet her eventually and like hey you inspired me to play but I definitely didn't do it immediately because I feel like I'd have been way too awkward <laughs> I'd been too shy and too awkward to do that but like now that I feel a bit more comfortable in the community that the teacher PG community that I'm in I felt way more comfortable telling her that she did like she did inspire me um but yeah now that I'm in the community and I've actively looked for like people of color and black people I've seen more it's still not a lot, um, but I've seen more. And I definitely do agree with you because even me as a as a co-founder of Friends Who All Dies, um, when we're, so these, um, for example, the charity streams are playing, we just do, we kind of like do a sign-up sheet for everyone and just post it out. 
we post it into different discords, different Twitters, and whoever want, who's, whoever's interested signs up and we like pick people from there so they can put them into games. And even from that, we realized that there weren't very many people of color um, like joining. So what we ended up doing is actively looking for them. So we would feel like we'd like, we would go to a person of color. Um, so like my friend um, B, for example, B Zelda on Twitter, they're oh, very, they're good, been... good friends of the Rollist uh, here as well. Huh? Uh, yeah, they're really sweet. Like, she's awesome. Um, they helped me out. They helped me out a lot to like navigate this TTRPG realm because I'm still very new to it, but they've been in it for a while. So they kind of like helped me, tell me who to avoid, who to engage, kind of recommend me to different players and different um, GMs. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things that helps is um, one actively seek it out for um, people of color. So a lot of our, for example, um, we don't we don't say no to um, white people, of course, but we do say that people of color take priority. So if we see that um, a person of color and a white person both signed up to for the, first, for the same game, we'll most likely go with the person of color because just representation wise, there's just not many people of color. Um, that's one way that really helps with helping bump up representation. And another is just asking. Like, um, I have a few people who um, who ask me to play with them. And if I, if I can't, I would just be like, oh, sorry, I can't play, but here are some people who can. And I'm rep I'll recommend some people who, of color who can. Or if I can play, and I know that they're still looking for other players, I'll again recommend um, people of color that can play, who are like really good, who haven't, or well, not even just really good, people of color that probably haven't played before, mm -hmm. but would be interested in trying for the first time. So I think um, one of the things a lot of people, um, especially now, now that um, teacher RPGs are come, becoming a thing that could, you can actually profit from, people are being a lot less willing to give first comers a try um, because they want like, they want the professionals, they want the big names. Um, but people forget that even the big names were people who only tried for the first time at some point. So you should always give those people a try and then you never know, they might end up exploding and being incredible and then become the next big thing. Um, yeah, yeah. You, ju you just need... At the end of, uh, my personal opinion is that at the end of the day for for an actual play, most of the time you need someone with an interesting personality, someone personable. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time it, it does the trick. Uh, I don't know... I don't know players which are so more qualified than other players. I mean, game masters maybe, but yeah, even I mean, it's uh, yeah, anyone anyone can do it, especially in a supportive environment with the right exactly, tools yeah. and and so on. Uh, it, it can go uh, very well. It's actually something we're really big on over in Friends Roll Dice, because um, again, for these charity events. A lot of the games are games that no one's ever played before, or like most of the people haven't played because we like to pick um, D and D's a Goliath. Um, it's when people think TTRPGs, they usually think D and D, and um, and it's it's not a bad game. I mean, it's been around for a long time for a reason, but there are other games that are really good that don't get enough like light and um, opportunity to be played. So we use the charity events to play like indie TTRPGs or just games that aren't really played much. And as a result, a lot of the players haven't played the game before. So they usually it's usually the first time role playing as a whole or role playing that specific in that specific system. And we like to we do that and like to make sure that's a really safe environment for them to like be, like, be able to make mistakes and be like, it's fine. We're all making mistakes here. Because quite frankly, even the GM sometimes hasn't played the game before. <laughs> um, so I think having that kind of space for newcomers, even long-time players is really, really helpful, especially for the marginalized community who already find it difficult to really get into um, the community. We, we were talking about the, the sinful circle of you play at times which matches the American audience. Uh, yeah. Didn't you feel the, some pressure also uh, about that, about not playing Dungeons & Dragons? Because I know from experience that if I do something Dungeons & Dragons, it's immediately more popular. The, the, there's yeah. more downloads, more attraction, and so on. So when you're running a charity or a channel, uh, yeah, or do you still play other games in a way when you say, well, maybe you could raise more money if we were playing 
yeah. Curse of Thrad so, instead uh, of I Ant and so on. I so we already have a D&D like campaign on the channel and I'll be honest if we didn't I would probably would include a D&D at least a D&D game amongst the charity um, games but we already have one and I don't want to if I have the opportunity to, to highlight another game I might as well you know yeah um I will admit that there is like so I'm I'm the events organizer <laughs> and when I when we choose games and what time they're going to be in and what players to like what special guests for example to put in them I definitely think about balancing it out so like if it's a not if it's a game that's not very well known and probably won't get many viewers I'll try and um, get a player who's very well known and will probably attract a bunch of viewers so that when you put them together at least hopefully balance it out bring a decent amount of people who are either in, invested in the game system or invested in the special guests that we brought on. Um, and then that ho- usually helps with the amount of money being raised. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, I do agree. D&D, it brings a lot of, a lot of viewers, a lot more viewers than any other system. And, um, but, yeah, but for that same reason, I feel like I, I, I don't really like adding to it because one, it doesn't make a difference my 15 viewers for my dnt campaign is barely anything to the i don't know like probably 100k viewers in total that dnt gets anyway but my 15 viewers for a game that no one plays is a big difference for them yeah 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 so so so, yeah yeah, you you just at the end of the day it's free work it's free promotional work you are doing for for a brand for for a product which can yeah. be produced by an individual, by a, a small indie publishing company, or the Behemoths, which is Dungeons and Dragons. So I'd be curious to have a, I don't know if a, you know this kind of Bloomberg articles, uh, if you would have an article which would calculate how much money it would m- represent if D&D was paying for all the free promotion they get, you know, in terms it of would viewers. Be, ex- be a lot. That yeah. would be a lot of money. And and because yeah. they're already on top, they, they don't really need or deserve that money <laughs> it's going exactly. to it's going to share all those like whether or, not, whether or not they deserve it or not is a different thing but the fact is they don't need it well but the indie creator who he's barely he's like made a passion project that barely anyone's um like played 10 people buying that game is a lot for them hmm. like that could be for like a lot of the indie games i see are like like five dollars ten dollars ten people buying that that's 50 to 100 dollars that's a lot that could make a big difference for some people. Yeah, I mean, when I say that they, they, they maybe don't deserve as much, what, what I find some something, you know, beyond any criticism of the, the character or the way the company is yeah. run it, in terms of, of being managed, I think something which people don't realize is that uh, Wizard of the Coast, Asbro, they got shareholders. And what I've seen is that even a company which is somewhat large, like Modifius here in London, and they got licensed products like Star Trek. I do know, yeah. I've seen, or Chaosium, who's kind of the number two in the in tabletop RPG with yeah. Call of Tulu. The money which goes into Chaosium goes into Chaosium paying its employees and Chaosium going to conventions and organizing stuff and giving back for promotional purpose, but still giving back to the community of tabletop roping, you, you know, com- promoting yeah. their own product, uh, the money which funnel- funnels into Wizards of the Coast, I don't know the proportion, but at least, at least half of it just goes into Hasbro to shareholders and yeah. just vanishes like that. It it, it doesn't go, yeah. doesn't go at Hasbro Wizard of the Coast. They don't come to UK UK Games Expo. They don't come to Spiel. They don't organize events in the UK or yeah. anywhere outside the US. I'm not even sure what they attend in the US because they, they pulled out of Gen Con also at some point, which uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, TSR created and they were on top. And at some point, people at Hasbro were like, "What's the money in us for Gen- in Gen Con? We're not making any money of that, so we're pulling out." And so, yeah, I would say, yeah. you know, if you give a buck to yeah, to wizards. It's not a bug towards you and the community. Even it's a yeah. it's a bug for 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 whoever does. Uh, I don't even know what Asbro does. GI Joes and, uh, and <laughs> Transformers. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, because 
I never actually thought about it to that extent, but that is a good point. Yeah, a lot of a lot of other um, like TCRPG publishers and creators, they have a whole thing about giving back in some way, but Wizards of the Coast doesn't do that very much. Yeah, and and again, it's not even giving back, but Modifius or Chaosium, they spend on themselves, on their business. Yeah, Wizards, their money goes to Asbro, and when Wizards want to do something, Asbro tells them, no, you're not getting money from us because you're too expensive because we're yeah. making more money doing the other thing but anyway uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so you mentioned you were one of the next game you're going to play a small independent game is uh, High Hunt uh, have you read it yeah. through already are you excited about playing this one or other games uh, what are the games you're playing because you mentioned games but you did not actually name any of them okay so uh, <laughs> I I Okay, so I hunt specifically. I'm actually very excited for it because um, one, I I'm the type of person I want to play every possible TTRPG system that I can. <laughs> so whenever I hear a game that I haven't played before, I jump at the opportunity. And Fate, Fate Core, and I hunt extension is one I haven't played before. I never, I don't think I've even watched anyone play it before. So um, I, I, I immediately jumped at the opportunity to play it. I'm reading through it. It looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> It it's, looks like a very, it looks, it looks very, very exciting, yeah. whimsical. Yeah, it's like a very whimsical kind of setting. Like I'm a, I'm essentially like a a hunter who, on on a payroll. So it's like just like a contract kind of deal where whenever I can, I just like sign up to fight a monster. That just the concept of that was very funny to me, because um, coming from like D and D for example, D and D kind of makes it so formal in a way mm -hmm. like i'm a i'm an adventurer i have to go on a quest and all that but i hunt kind of first of all modernizes it because in modern day like modern like a modern kind of setting but also makes it quote unquote, unquote realistic where if you're killing monsters people are gonna hire you to kill monsters and like there's gonna be like legal matters like contracts and stuff like actual normal pay it's gonna be like an actual business business model that's the norm a, a poor and, business but model because i, I think that the tagline is <laughs> monster hunting in the gig economy so you're not like yeah successful business running or in monster hunting yeah. like you know, to some extent ghostbusters could be it's no you're, exactly, you're yeah. signing up on an app to have a lousy badly paid job uh, like 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 yeah. being a herbert driver but uh, at monster hunting <laughs> yeah. that's that's exactly, really cool the Uber of monster hunters and i think that yeah i think that's a really funny concept I always i'm always a fan of getting like a really really mainstream idea of uh, adventure on monster hunter and then twisting it a little bit to make it a little bit, bit weird and just special i guess but i think um, really cool is you know it's very contemporary in terms of ideas concept and I find yeah. that so much of fantasy and science fiction right now, it's behind the curve. I guess it's because, you know, it's it's written by people to, to arrive to the point where you can write a TV show, a movie. Exactly. You need to make your way in the industry, so you're rather old, <laughs> often you're white and so on, a male. But so as soon as we see stuff, I think they realize that. That's why we got a lot of stuff set in the 90s and the 80s, because they yeah. realized they are bad at writing anything happening today anything <laughs> any situation in which people would say yeah but if i were in this situation i pick up my phone i google it and and yeah. then I, I do the thing or i call someone so because they, they don't ho have the automatism the familiarity with technology and a number of elements and realities today they tend to say well i might as well do something in the past so uh, I won't yeah. be told. I'm doing that with some games. I'm doing. I got a contemporary occult game called. Uh, well, I got. Uh, I run this game called Nephilim. Uh, it's a bit like Vampire the Masquerade, but uh, with other beings. And one of the things I did for quite a long time is I said it in the 90s because I started playing it in the 90s. And if I was running it today, immediately people would say, "Well, I take my phone and I Google it, or I look yeah. on my Google Map." And and I just don't know how to deal with that. In That's a game, a very good point. Yeah, because even even players sometimes don't have to deal with that, which I think is an outcome of so many games is is a result of so many games being like in the nineties or in a fantasy genre. Because I think I remember recently I was watching one of my friends in a, a stream. It was it's based in modern day. It's I think actually it's, I think the same realm. I think the same universe as the um, Vampires the Masquerade. I think it's called 
werewolves. The yeah, apocalypse. Or the the, the, rec- yeah. the reckoning or yeah. again we were talking about that before we started recording the there's so yeah. many editions, the reckoning, the the becoming, the the fate condensed, con- accelerated, and so on. But it's werewolf, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they, they were they were they had they were in a situation where they were in a room that was pitch black, and they couldn't see, and and this was set in modern day. And being the people who've obviously quite clearly played the fantasy genre constantly, they were like, why don't we start a fire? And then the GM very, the GM was like kind of chuckling. I was like, I just want to point out you have a phone that has a torch. You can, you can do that. And everyone's reaction was just like a, just a simultaneous face, like a face palm. Because like you just, at this point, because of how like saturated the market is with like fantasy or um, fantasy or like 90s and 80s kind of um, setting, you forget that you can also play it now in a time period like that's kind of parallel to now and you have those conveniences. But it's a good point because there are a lot of um, challenges that would be very hard to make challenging as a DM um, if you're set in modern day. <laughs> like getting lost is not going to happen most of the time because you have Google Maps or you have some kind of at least some kind of navigation system on your phone. Or like, again, like I previously mentioned, having needing dark vision probably won't be an issue because again you have a phone where you can have just have a torch but I, I also think those um not limitations but those challenges can also bring about um more interesting stories that aren't just the same thing over and over again because with most for example with D, most of the time it's is a pretty similar story over and over again maybe with slight differences with like I don't know, maybe different motivations for the bad guy, but it's usually the same thing, like to the point where there are memes about it. Like there are memes about the rogue. Like the rogue is nearly always played in the same way because the same challenges are presented to you in the in D and D. Um, but with more modern modern based games, there are just so many different like new avenues that you can go down, which I think is really fun. And which is also why I went with I kind of jumped the idea of high eye hunt because. I kind of like the idea of um, role playing modern day and kind of going through those challenges instead. Yeah, the, the, I really like I and the, there's a lot of stuff in there which uh, really appeal to me. It's funny how I had the problem with Star Wars, I had the opposite situation with Star Wars. I was running Star Wars and I used to, I, I started with Star Wars. I started with Star Wars D6 and I was surrounded by Star Wars mm. fans. It was even before the prequels. That's how old I am. <laughs> so people had a very clear of what idea of what Star Wars was. And it was the late 90s. So we were not in this information technology age. As We were not right in the middle as we are right yeah. now. And, and so for me running Star Wars when I ran it again a few years ago I was like yeah Star Wars feet under the table no problem I know everything I tell people it's Star Wars they know what it's about and and pl- my players got so confused from the get go <laughs> and I was so confused about them being confused and they, they brought up stuff like okay we, we are on Tatooine uh, we do the thing okay uh, we're gonna take the starship to make satellite views of the planet and I'm like uh no actually you don't do that because they don't do that in star wars oh i'm gonna use a droid and use it like a uav uh you know like they yeah. do in <laughs> afghanistan yeah actually you cannot do that because you're a smuggler <laughs> oh, i'm gonna connect to the holonet which is like the internet I'm like no actually so i had to come up with this long explanation to say yeah look star wars it's world war ii but in space it's not it's not yeah. the future. It's not even present-day technology. It's actually kind of the past. Uh, the the binoculars and their camera, they all suck for some reason. They cannot take a <laughs> decent photograph in Star Wars. So you need to consider that. And the, the stuff also like James Bond, uh, I find it's become... people. Uh, I heard people suggest, and I think it's a good suggestion, that the next James Bond should be in the past because there's so much stuff about James Bond which yeah. is boring today like all the gadgets yeah. it's like most yeah most of the gadgets like most of the gadgets <laughs> are that looks cool it's like the gadget a lot of the gadgets that looks cool looks cool because they're like so big and fancy but like most of the gadgets now would be like tiny yeah. like for like um like just 
non like tiny non-existent or just wouldn't be useful in the first place because like they'd probably be like um it's like lock picking probably wouldn't be very useful nowadays when there's electric locks for most things anyway yeah every, everything <laughs> is an app like and it contactless or just bond what, <laughs> exactly. what are you doing oh you, you got the app to open the doors okay swipe uh <laughs> door. okay you got the app uh, you you're trying to track her okay i'm just gonna connect just to gonna... instagram and <laughs> hack things I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. But it's also, again, but I also think shying away from it is a thing that we shouldn't do. Um, because, because again, we're going to eventually reach a point where there's just nothing else to do in the past. <laughs> there's just going to be, it's going to reach a point where we're going to do everything we can in, in a setting that's based in the past that every story is going to sound the same. Yeah, so, but at the same time, I think it means, that that's where I earned is interesting, is that at some point we need to... Sp- Stop doing James Bond. We need to stop doing Star Wars. We need to come up. Yeah. Or even I'm a I'm a Star Trek fan, but uh, we need to uh, create new stuff. Like uh, in science fiction, I'm waiting for something. I find I see very few science fiction stuff which looks like or actual future. You know, anticipation yeah. fiction. Like okay, the future will look like this. Okay, yeah, I can see that because that's where we are today. We got social network and so on. Except maybe Black Mirror, but it's it's so grim Black and Mirror. and contained, yeah. which is so yeah. Yeah, what's what's the what's the the new Star Trek which acknowledges all the stuff which didn't go the the Star Trek way uh, in a sense? How would you write yeah, that? That's... I I think again, I'm not like a game designer, so I have very little like 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 clue of how it worked but i think things like so recently i heard about i haven't watched it but i think it's an amazon show called the expense and it doesn't have like i don't think it will get the following or really have the following of like star trek or star wars but it's a science um, science fiction show and i think the publisher i think it's called green ronin i think that's what he yeah um, i think it's green ronin who did the did the role-playing game yeah yeah they made the role role-playing game of it and I think reaching, like, at least trying, because there's going to be flops. There are going to be a lot of flops. Like, that's undeniable. But avoiding the setting entirely, just so you don't flop, is just going to hurt the industry. So I think um, making those, like, reaches for things, for settings that are set now, and possibly failing, because there will be some that fail, but at least someone else will be like, okay, I see what they're trying to do there. They made this mistake. Let me try. Let me try and figure out something myself and improve on that, and then maybe make the next Star Trek, for example, or the next um, Star Wars. Because I think, especially now, in just mainstream media, especially, there's a lot of like sequels and prequels and just reboots and so new, like legitimately new media, new IPs, and People are starting to get tired of it, I think. Yeah, I think we're gonna get um, there. But I think the problem is yeah. we I don't know, maybe maybe it will come up out of another platform. Might be Twitch, might be role playing game, might be YouTube, I don't know, but it's yeah, everything's become so risk averse and so expensive. Yeah. I would really prefer even big production that there's a lot of big production I'm like we should cut the budget of this thing by two and get rid of all this stuff, which I don't think, I mean, how many action sequence scene I've seen. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is so long. I mean, do me yeah. even, you know, even Batman, which is a tired French franchise. I would be interested in a low budget Batman. I guess that's what Joker was. I didn't see it, but I'd be, I'd be, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be down for, for a low budget Batman and see what, what it looks like. But, uh, Joker but, was really good. Like I think, it's still I still think it's a bit of a um, Joker. I think Joker's still a bit of an example of a, a quote unquote reboot because mm. they're using they're using the popularity of the Joker to promote that. But it was such a different turn. It was such a different take on the Joker that it at least felt new. Yeah. Um, like I'm pretty sure he won a ton of awards as well. It got pretty good reviews from people who are watching it. I watched it and I really enjoyed it. And it it was them taking a, at least a bit of a step out of their comfort zone to try something different and new, and is a, a pretty decent example of how um, sometimes trying something different, trying to, even though it, whatever you did before wasn't broken, trying something different could be even better. 
and yeah hopefully more people in every part of the industry whether it's like ttrpgs or movies or anything hopefully they'll lean into that as well i think i mean it's uh we are this this will be released in different formats of uh over time so people might be listening to that uh Months, months away, but when we re <laughs> we're recording this, it, it's the mid October, mid end October. So Halloween is near. Uh, what I find, what I keep really enjoy about the horror genre, is that it's uh, there's there's sort of a production culture of producing stuff at low or medium sized budget. Yeah. So I find that's where you find more of this creativity, and you can have the the get out, the us, uh, different exactly, things, exploring, yeah. trying out things, and I think the spirit is you can produce. I think that there's literally production companies which are run like that, uh, even in in Hollywood, which are okay. We produce ten low medium budget horror movies, and we just need one to be successful, really successful exactly. among them to pay for all the others and and be uh, make huge benefits. I think it's a much yeah. better approach than than putting all the brakes on uh, one movie with a big budget, with a big star, exactly, with a yeah. big promotion on the buses and so on. Especially with COVID, I think that there's really room to trying to produce low budget stuff. And you do one, you see if it works. If it works, you make it a franchise. Maybe, maybe not. It depends. Exactly. But uh, you, you go ahead. That's a good it. point. Especially now with COVID, where it's already hard to do those big budget things. You might as well do the smaller ones and see how it goes i think that's a really good point so i think one i think one of the i haven't watched it but the cult classic i think is called um oh no wait what was it called the horror movie it was like it i think it was i don't think it was the first one but i think it was the first horror movie that got big that had like a aesthetic of like a home recording of a horror uh, movie that had like Blair, a horror Blair witch like project that's it Blair witch project yeah and i think that's like just doing something different and low budget like that is a very good example of how you don't need eight, nine, ten zeros at the end of your budget to make a really good movie and maybe even make those eight, nine, ten zeros at the end back from the people who actually enjoyed a movie and went to watch it. I wonder sometimes uh, about that when uh, I'm watching. I think there's a lot of talents expressed on stuff, a platform like TikTok. And I keep wondering: Is there yeah, are there yeah. chances? Or do we have a generation there who might go out, especially with COVID and the very very tough times ahead? Uh, that's that's by no means uh, a way to smoothen the situation. But uh, there's been a lot of times like that in the past where there were a lot of people unemployed, and some of them ended up making creations of their own. So. Yeah. So I hope maybe people will go out with cell phones and so on and uh, and try to to do you know not even a long feature a movie just a, a short movie and get it out on YouTube. Uh, there's there's yeah. a lot of people doing that. I, I hope I hope we we'll see more of them. And I mean it's a bit it's a bit different, but you know Netflix they just announced they they're not renewing or they canceled the next season of Glow. Uh, on one hand yeah. I'm sad because I liked Glow, but on the other hand you know between Having seven seasons of Glow, or having uh, two seasons of seven different shows. Even if I yeah. like Glow, I still prefer not having a, a next season of Glow. But at least Netflix is trying different stuff, and some of them are for yeah. me. Some I'm not. Yeah, because I think you brought up what you brought up with um, like making something like a mini like show or movie on YouTube is a really good point. Because Twitch, like stuff like Twitch, YouTube. Recently, Mixer, but Mixer kind of shut down. But Twitch and YouTube have become big and like they're catching the eyes of mainstream media now. Like people who like sponsorships that usually would be sponsoring TV shows are now like looking to Twitch and YouTube to sponsor creators. And I think as that happens more, there'll be more of an incentive for people to make like shows and like even if they're like low budget, just making shows on YouTube. So I think. For, I think one of the examples is YouTube Red. I think it's called YouTube Red. I think they might have changed it recently, but YouTube Red was a like a whole program where they paid um, YouTube creators to make like a show, just like a mini show for, just specifically for YouTube. And it, it was basically like the Netflix of YouTube, I guess. But, um, and they just gave creators like a budget, like not crazy, nothing like in a million, nothing Hollywood level, but just gave them a budget to create whatever they want. 
they usually never had their fingers in it too much. They didn't tell them what to do. They was like, we like your content. Clearly people enjoy your content. So here's some money, make more content. And I think, I think if once more, once more companies and industries like embrace that kind of mindset, I think we'll start seeing more like interesting and just different things to play, watch in general, in the, like in, in general. I was quickly Googling because <clears throat> I, I'm not, I'm not a, a big viewer of the show, but if people are curious about somewhat low level production, well, not, not level production, but low budget production, it's not the same. Uh, I recommend people to go check out Ren, the girl with the mark. Uh, I believe it started as a YouTube show, maybe with a few pilots and it's become a prime video show. And uh, it's made yeah. by someone here in the UK and it's, yeah, it's, it's low budget medieval fantasy and i think it's great that people go out and and, and try stuff like that so so people should go medieval check it out yeah. we hit the the one hour mark so it's going to be uh time for us to, to say goodbye are there any other <laughs> stuff you you wish to to plug yeah? um I, I guess i'll go down the list of things i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> go ahead um i have a whole list um so for for, for one um I'm part of a D I'm going to be part of a DD campaign called Heroes of Eastera. Um, that's starting tomorrow. So at least tomorrow when this is recorded. So, so October 22nd. 22nd. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be in a DD campaign called Heroes of Eastera over on um, a channel called Scriv the Bard. That's S S C R I V T H E B A R D. If you send um, it, uh, if you send me the link via via Twitter DM. Afterward, awesome. I will yeah, include the link in the description of the episode so people can head there, okay. find you, find uh, everything you, you got, you're about to mention. So go ahead, tell everything, okay. awesome. and, and then I'll include the links. Okay, so yeah, screw the bard. I'll be on. I'll be playing a Warforged monk on a DnD campaign called Heroes of the Astero. Um, I to, today I'm going to have just finished my um, mini series of in, it came from the loop, which was a Tales from the Loop campaign mini series as I played on rule of law um every month hopefully it'll still be happening um but every month uh, you can find me over on super idols rpg which is a actual play podcast where i play a super idol magical boy it's, it's a lot of fun I, we use the mask system it's it's a ton of fun you definitely need to listen the people i'm playing with the gm it's all amazing the editing is top tier um i'm going to be in a burn Brat campaign not sure when that's happening because it's been pushed back a bit because of like just behind the scenes stuff going on. Burn Bright, but which I heard it, it, it is sold as the very first. I don't think it's quite true, but it's sold as the very first uh, role playing game designed for streaming. I think something. Yeah, like designed that. for streaming and designed for. I think designed for Raw Twenty as well, like specifically for Raw Twenty. I think it was the first one. It's it's a lot of fun. The creatures and like aliens you can play are very weird, um, but it's a ton of fun to play. Um, that's going to be starting. In like a week or two, I hopefully <laughs> it was, it, we don't know how far we need push back, but it should it will definitely be starting by mid November, um, and that's going to be over on the Chromatic Chimeras channel. Um, I Hunt is going to be starting next week, which I'm very excited for, and that's going to be over an, on Encounter Roleplay. Oh and wow! I'm going to be in a Swordsfall, yeah, and I'm going to be in a Swordsfall. Um, uh, like mini series, I think it's gonna be like four sessions, and that's gonna be over on Little Red Dot. Um, and I'm very excited for that. So it's for a very fun, um, fun game made by a, a black person, a person of color. So I'm very, very excited to um, um, go through that world and help promote it. I guess. Exciting. Yeah, that's me. I, I guess I also want to quickly plug again. Um, Friends Roll Dice. Yeah, um, go ahead. I think, but um, that Friends Roll Dice is a TCRPG channel that I'm a, one of the co-founders of and the event organizer of. And at the moment, we are doing a charity event. So if you're listening and you want to check out the charity event, we, we stream every four months. We're going to be streaming every Tuesday, every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday um, as we raise money for charity. And on November the 1st, it's going to be a big 13-hour stream where we have a bunch of special guests for that and a bunch of games um, that we're going to highlight. So yeah, check it out. Come donate. Even if you can't, even if you can't stick around to watch, at least you know, donate. Give to a good cause. Great, and for people who are not aware, even if you if you happen to have Amazon Prime and you go on Twitch, you can connect your Amazon Prime. It won't cost you anything, but then if you follow yeah. channels and watch them, 
uh, the streamers uh, get a little contribution from Amazon. So if you're paying for Amazon exactly. Prime already, you should definitely go to Twitch and especially for charity streams and you can support creators uh, that way. Exactly. Thank you so much, Drax. Uh, it's been a, a delight. Uh, it's been uh, lifting my week to have a, a little chat with you. So uh, you're welcome <laughs> it's been great to... Talking to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And uh, yeah, people go check out uh, Rolling With Friends uh, uh, as soon uh, as possible. See you. Bye. Bye.